Good morning, and thank you for standing by. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing star, then 1, and by recording your first and last name clearly. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to your host for today, Ms. Barbara Lapini. Ma'am, you may begin. Good morning to our participants in the United States and good evening to our speakers in India. Thank you for joining us for our webinar on getting your products into India and understanding Indian customs. I'm pleased to note that we have more than 80 people registered for the webinar today. Uh, my name is Barbara Lapini. I'm an international trade specialist with the India Business Center of the Trade Information Center. Uh, the Trade Information Center is part of the U.S. Commercial Service of the Department of Commerce. I'd like to welcome all the U.S. Commercial Service clients and other part webinar participants in the exporting community who are joining us from across the United States to learn about Indian customs. Our speakers include Dr. Abdul Sheikh, Senior Economist with the India Business Center of the Trade Information Center, Ms. Eileen Nandy, Principal Commercial Officer with the U.S. Commercial Service in Chennai, India, Mr. Vijay Anand, Customs Manager for India with Expeditors International, Mr. Vimal Rat, uh, Manager of Planning, Engineering, and Operations Support with FedEx in India. All the speakers will be available at the end of the presentations to answer your questions. Contact information will also be provided at the end of the webinar if you have any additional questions after the event. For those of you who just joined, you can still log on to the webinar by entering the URL website and passcode provided as per the instructions that were sent to you by email. Um, we do have a few housekeeping details to make sure that everyone gets the most benefit from today's webinar. Uh, as I mentioned, you'll hear, be able to hear the presentations via your telephone and view it simultaneously on your computer. If you are not hooked up through both, please take a moment to do this. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, please press star, star zero any time during the presentation. Uh, we are planning the, the question and answer session at the end of all the presentations, so please hold your questions until the end. This will be operator assistance. The operator will put your, you in queue to have your line taken off mute to ask a question. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Abdul Sheikh, Senior Economist at the India Business Center. Abdul? Thank you, Barbara. And uh, uh, good morning and good evening to our uh, speakers uh, in India and all the folks who joined us uh, from the United States. As Barbara said that uh, we have an India Business Center which is uh, open recently uh, because of the significance of doing business in India and more and more uh, American companies uh, and clients are uh, looking for information. So today's uh, focus is more how to get your uh, products across the borders in India. Uh, but before that, uh, we focus on it. I thought I will give you a kind of a brief overview of uh, opportunities and challenges of uh, doing business in India. Uh, the first thing is uh, why we need to focus on India. You know, India is considered one of the mega markets and one of the BRIC countries where the United States is focusing on uh, increasing exports, and India is one of them. And it is one of the fastest growing uh, free market uh, economy. Uh, yeah, for the last uh, several years, it has been growing uh, very rapidly. Even during the time of uh, world recession, India continues to grow. And Indians are looking for uh, U.S. products because the uh, U.S. have competitive advantage in large number of products that you folks in America uh, produce them. Uh, this is a map of India, uh, and you can see India has uh, uh, 29 states and six union territories, and southern part of India is more prosperous and uh, uh, industrialized, uh, so obviously the markets are more fertile. Uh, and then the western part of India is also more uh, uh, prosperous and industrialized as well. So we have... Uh, uh, several of these uh, trade missions that uh, we undertake from time to time to take American companies to uh, India. 
Uh, the, the few facts, I think many of you may be familiar with that. India is uh, very uh, highly populated. Uh, it has more than three times of the U.S. population, uh, close to 1.2 billion, and uh, with the one-third of the U.S. territory, so you can see the congestion when you go to India. It is the sixth largest uh, country in terms of purchasing power, and more strikingly, it has a large and growing middle-class population, which is a very good uh, uh, market for U.S. products. And uh, it is easier to do business uh, in India because English is widely spoken, and uh, English, I think, the British have, uh, have left uh, one good legacy, that is the language, so they really enjoy the fruits of that. Uh, India's uh, uh, GDP has been growing rapidly, as I said, and more than 100 fortune uh, companies uh, have their R&D operations, so because India is now considered to be the intellectual capital of uh, Asia. Uh, as I said, that uh, we have a website, uh, export.gov slash India, and this is the India Business Center. Uh, everything uh, that you want to know about India and doing business with India, and that information is uh, available on this website. And we update that uh, with the help of our colleagues uh, in India and also other uh, uh, organizations uh, in India as well as in the United States. So if you want to uh, start uh, from the beginning, then you can understand what is the basic of exporting, how to start trading with India. And we have, uh, uh, last time I was looking at, uh, there were more than 4,000 market research reports on various industries uh, that are also posted on uh, the website. And uh, you can also find the duties and tariff because that is one of the important components that uh, you need to know how much India taxes uh, or uh, levy tariff because it is a very complex uh, mechanism and uh, still India is uh, one of the higher tariff uh, uh, countries. Uh, we also post all the trade events uh, in, you know, any places that is taking place and the trade missions. We, I think uh, importantly for you, if you are looking to sell products, we also have trade leads on that and we uh, post uh, uh, webinars as well. Uh, India is a, a growing market. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is only the 17th the largest export market, as you can see, that, of course, our neighbors are the largest exporters, followed by China. And uh, India is uh, 17. But I think what is important is the rate at which India's uh, U.S. exports to India is growing is more important. Uh, and as I said, that uh, it's a rapidly growing middle class. Uh, I think one of the important features of Indian economy is that it is uh, driven by domestic consumption, unlike China. As you can see, 62 percent of the GDP in India is due to private consumption. So they are uh, consumers and they are looking for various products and services that the Americans uh, make. And 71% of the population is under 35, and they are very Internet savvy, educated, uh, and uh, they are looking for American uh, products. Uh, and it is a growing market. Uh, it also is very challenging, and the private sectors and entrepreneurship is also growing. So there is a great opportunity for alliances, joint ventures, for American companies if they are looking for it. And we have a network uh, to assist you uh, both in the United States and uh, overseas. Uh, we have trade specialists in 108 U.S. cities. I think many of you have joined from different cities in the United States. We have a local uh, district export cen centers of the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, Commercial Service. We also have 150 posts in 80 countries including in India. I think Eileen will talk about more of those uh, offices in India, how they can help you. Now, these offices, both in the U.S. and overseas, can help you to locate international buyers, distributors, and agents, provide expert help at every stage of that, and also help you to enter the market. So we are here to help you, and uh, I think I also want to mention at this point 
that we have a uh, toll-free uh, hotline that you can call in. A live person will answer uh, uh, your question. And that number is 1-800-USA-TRADE. And this is uh, the commercial service. I think I will let uh, Eileen talk more about that. Now, even though the opportunities are striking in India, but there are also a lot of challenges, and you have to be very careful in doing business uh, in India. Uh, today, uh, you know, there is a lot of government uh, interference at all levels. Uh, as I said, there is a high tariff and access to uh, indirect taxes, uh, some restrictions on foreign investments, although they are liberalizing and more and more American companies are opening up for business, including Walmart has opened a wholesale outlet uh, in Gurgaon. Uh, uh, there are also some problems in terms of the intellectual property, so you have to be careful if you have an IPR or patent and trademark that you want to <coughs> uh, protect it. Uh, it is also a problem in India doing business because the uh, lack of infrastructure, uh, even though, uh, you know, it is growing, the airports are uh, multiplying, uh, more passengers are traveling, but still getting from one place to the other. And if anyone of you have recently visited and traveling by car from one, one location in a city like Bangalore or Mumbai or uh, New Delhi, you find that uh, the traffic congestion. And to add that, I think the Tata has added a new small car so more and more millions of Indians are planning to buy that, and it costs only $2,500. There's still some corruption and custom regulations, and my colleagues uh, and they who are experts from India will talk more about the custom regulations uh, in a few minutes. <clears throat> and uh, to facilitate, uh, I've listed some of the tips for doing business in India because it is important to find a good partner. We can help you to... Uh, do due diligence and uh, screen out from the good to, from the bad and so that you can deal with the uh, companies or the parties uh, where you want to do business. We can also help you to uh, understand the market and competition because we have market research reports. Uh, we have folks in uh, uh, India. Uh, commercial service can help you as well. It is important to do good planning and aggressive due diligence, but it also needs uh, patience and commitment on your part because things don't happen as rapidly as we are uh, familiar in the United States. Uh, we don't get instant results uh, in India. And uh, you need to get export counseling. We are here to help you, uh, and you can call uh, Trade Information Center, India Business Center, at 1-800-USA-TRADE. And it is uh, equally important to understand the rules and regulations and standards, uh, and they can be very uh, complex, and uh, unless you know those regulations, it is very difficult to be successful in India. And especially the documentation, I think the customs require extensive, uh, which uh, has uh, problems in free flow of trade across the borders, uh, there are complex tariff structure, multiple exemptions, and uh, uh, there's also various uh, uh, export promotion program and uh, the uh, enterprise zones where you locate your company, and all of that information is essential. These documentations I'm going to skip because I think our custom people will talk more about that. Now, this is a, a, the last slide that is... Uh, the World Bank conducts surveys of all the countries in the world to determine how easy to do business in India. And India has made significant progress from 2007 to 2008, uh, but uh, uh, still it is a long way to go, particularly, uh, you know, the uh, dealing with licenses and uh, uh, you're, you're taking the products across borders which has uh, trading across borders, as you can see, was 142 ranks, but it has gone to 79. So there is a significant improvement, and India is trying to improve their customs, uh, other regulations besides 
other problems that they encounter because they are now realizing that unless they improve these regulatory environment, it is very difficult to attract uh, foreign investment and foreign businesses. So that is a kind of a quick overview, and my colleague from from uh, Chennai will uh, uh, will give you uh, the view from the Indian side. Thank you very much, and. Thank you very much, Abdul, that was for your, that very interesting presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Eileen Nandy, the Principal Commercial Officer with the U.S. Commercial Service in Chennai. Eileen? Uh, thank you, Barbara uh, and, and Abdul. Good morning, everyone, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to just talk very briefly, uh, since Abdul gave an overview of doing business in India, of uh, how, how we can help you succeed in, in the market. I'm having trouble forwarding my slides. Hang on, Eileen. Let me see if I can. There you go. Thank you. Um, basically, we are uh, part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, uh, we work closely with our colleagues in the uh, Indian Business Center, and we are here to uh, help you make sales to the Indian market. Next slide. Uh, we have offices um, in seven cities throughout India, um, and uh, some of the major ports um, that we uh, deal with, work with are here in Chennai, um, Bombay, and uh, of course the capital of Delhi, Delhi um, where a lot of uh, cargo uh, flights arrive in. Um, but there, there are minor ports all throughout the country, and um, of course uh, most of the major, uh, all the major cities and, and many minor cities have, um, have uh, international um, uh, airport facilities. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows you the um, in Indo-U.S. trade. Um, you know, before 2001, we, people used to joke that um, trade was as flat as the chapati, and then you can really see how it's taken off, um, where every year the uh, bilateral trade would increase by 20 to 30 percent, um, and it's so now it's a very robust uh, 44.5 million uh, billion dollars. Um, 2009 has shown a little bit of a weakening, um, kind of, of about 2.9 percent. Um, but what's, what's, in, what's important to remember from the Indian perspective is that their uh, Indian exports to the United States um, have dropped substantially. Uh, this afternoon, I happened um, to spend most of my afternoon actually at the customs office here, uh, and they said that um, Indian exports to the United States were down by as much as 40 percent. Um, and uh, this, this could actually explain why we're seeing a little bit of an uptick in terms of um, customs issues. Although I have to say, I've been here um, in Chennai for one year, uh, and, and I just had several issues pop up in the past week. Um, so I'm not sure if it's, uh, they have more time to scrutinize um, the incoming um, or even outbound shipments or um, what, what, what that issue is. But uh, we are seeing an uptick. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is just showing uh, uh, investment, U.S. investment in India. Uh, and what's interesting here is that um, the, the smaller portion you can see, Indian companies are increasingly more uh, confident on the global uh, uh, stage and in, in investing more in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we can help you um, basically uh, by doing matchmaking, um, working at trade shows and, and missions, uh, counseling, as Abdul mentioned. Um, and uh, if you have something stuck in customs and it, if you can't get it out, uh, give, give us a call and, and we can help um, work with our, our partners here to find out what the problem is and, and get it. Um, uh, because, of course, um, nobody wants to pay demurred uh, charges and uh, everybody wants to get their uh, shipments released. So uh, we can help you do that. Uh, next slide. Um, again, uh, uh, my contact information will be released at the at the uh, end. Um, I just wanted to make this short and sweet because um, the um, I know you're all here to listen to the um, the, the service experts. Uh, so please contact us if you have uh, issues or um, need any assistance in uh, selling to the Indian market. We'd be very happy to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, that, for that uh, interesting overview of uh, what the U.S. Commercial Service can do in India to help U.S. exporters. Our next speaker will be Mr. Vijay Anand, uh, Customs Manager with, uh, for India with Expeditors International. Mr. Anand? Yes. 
morning ladies and gentlemen and uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity let me give you an overview about uh, indian customs brokerage setup i think the slide is not moving babra there we go okay uh just to give an idea about uh, the agenda of this presentation is uh, first one will be a overview about the regulatory for customs the next one is about understanding the indian duty structure the next one would be the requirements to do exim in india what i mean by exim here is exports and imports in india and then uh, import customs clearance process and export customs clearance process and special schemes available uh, provided by the government of india and the special privileged areas so let us see the regulatory first the indian regulatory is called the uh, central board of excise and customs they formulate the policy concerning the levy and collection of you know customs and excise duty and also to prevent the smuggling and administration of matters relating to customs and excise central excise and narcotics and they are the administrative authorities of customs house central excise commissioner rate and central revenues control laboratory they come under the ministry of finance and under the ministry of finance we have three departments the first one is the department of economic affairs the next one is department of revenue and the third one is department of expenditure cbec the central board of excise and customs comes under the department of revenue the next one please just to give an idea about the customs <laughs> duty customs duty is kind of an indirect tax which is related on the goods of international trade in economic sense it is also called as the consumption tax it is a duty levied by the government in relation to the goods which is imported It is also known as the import duty. In the same vein, duty related on export containment is called export duty. There are certain items when it gets exported out of India, it attracts a duty. Tariff, which is actually a list of commodities along with the levyable rate of customs duty, is popularly understood as customs duty. And there is also another one called the excise tax, which is basically for uh, goods when it is getting exported out of India. And uh, these are, you know, like uh, the Maybe on the manufacture of goods when these goods leave the place of manufacture. So earlier it was known as uh, you know central excise duty and also known as the send back. Manufacturers are allowed to offset the duty paid on materials used in the manufacturing process by using the duty as a credit against the excise tax through a process known as send back credit. What it means is like if you import a good into India for the raw materials and if you have paid a duty for it. and when you export the finished good you can adjust the you know the proportion or the you know the percentage of duty which you have already paid when you do the exports out of india next slide please just to give an idea about the indian duty structure i mean any dutyable good will basically attract the first four duties in the black which is basically the basic duty of customs the next one is the counter countervailing duty the third one is the additional customs duty and the fourth one is education tax so any dutyable good will attract you know any of i mean all this force and there are also other duties which is known as you know like the the effect duty i mean if customs or the government decides to effect a particular percentage of duty on a particular commodity or tariff they can issue a notice and effect a different duty for this particular product and there are preferential rate of duties which are basically you know with relevance to the free trade agreements we have with different countries you know and these countries have a, a discounted duty structure of you know whatever so these are coming under the preferential rate of duty and of course the third one we all know is anti dumping duty if any commodity which is imported into india i mean if the price of that particular commodity is lower than the world market level then the customs will impose an anti dumping duty and the fourth one is the safeguard duty i mean the indian customs has uh, you know a list of developed nations in terms of their import into india if any one particular country's aggregate imports goes over 3% then a safeguard duty is imposed and the other scenario is the aggregate of all the developed nations countries uh, import exceeds by 9% then there is an application of safeguard duty as well next slide please <coughs> Just to give an idea about the process in terms of the custom clearance, I mean uh, the way it is done is you know the original import document. This the, this slide is about the import custom clearance. Original import documents are required three days prior to the arrival of the vessel, and uh, the customs 
if you know, I mean, the, you can find the bill of entry or the import entry through EDI, and after the arrival of the vessel at the seaport, the bill of entry will be assessed by the customs, and customs duty and taxes will be paid. Then you have to receive a delivery order from the steamship line, and the you know forwarder, and the customs examination will be completed at the CFS. Laden container cargo shall be removed from CFS for delivery to containing factory. Normally, the process takes between one to three days for an FCL container. I would offer one to two working days for the custom clearance and delivery planning. Now, most of the companies or the customers in India would prefer to clear the goods within three days because the free time allowed in the seaport or the customs is only three working days. So, anything goes beyond three days, you will have to, you know, land up paying demurrages. So, more often it is all cleared under three days if there is no issues on the documentation. Next slide, please. Okay, this is on the air import clearance process. Similarly, like, uh, in, I mean, the on the air freight part, customs will accept copies. On the sea freight part, you need the original documents to clear the goods. But on the air import part, copies is enough. Similarly, the EDA bill of entry or the import entry is filed with the customs. After the arrival of the flight at the airport, the bill of entry will be assessed by customs, and you pay the duty and taxes. Receive delivery order from airline and forwarder, and customs examination will be completed at the airport. Cargo will be moved out of the airport for delivery to contain its location. The lead time to do this activity normally takes between one to two working days. And even on the air import front, the free time available is only for three days. And in India, most of the international flights, I would say like 75 to 80 percent of the international flights land only in the midnight. So normally the process goes to the second day of the arrival. And by the same day's evening, I mean, you would be in a position to clear customs and remove the freight out of airport. Next slide, please. On, this is for the process on export. I mean, uh, just wanted to share it with you, but I know most of the customers are planning to do imports into India, but the export process is very, very simple in India, both on the air front as well as the sea front. It normally takes about one to two working days to do custom clearance, and uh, the documents required are invoice packing list, IEC number, AD code, and bank detail numbers. This IEC number, AD code description will come in the following slides, and uh, the export entry is called shipping bill. It's again filed through the EDI in the air or sea customs, and customs assessment will be carried out in the airport or seaport. The factory stuff containers will be moved to the seaport. For the cargo for air shipment will be moved to the airport. If you have an LCL shipment, it will be moved to a CFS, and then the stuffing happens in the container freight station. On a SCL container, the seal is verified. Cargo is examined for an LCL cargo, an airport for air shipments by the customs officer. The export processes are very, very simple. If all the documentation are perfect, you can even clear customs on export within three to four hours, subject to the documentation you know, remaining perfect. And finally, once the customs officer assesses it, he gives the let export, you know, certificate, and the container will be handed over to the cargo, I mean, the carrier, or the air freight shipment will be handed over to the carrier. Normally, I mean, 90 percent of the export shipments are cleared within one day, but some cases it may go to the second day as well. Next slide, please. Just to give an idea of what is Imported, I mean, I, I mean, IEC code and the authorized dealer code and the business identification number. These are the basic requirements to do imports or exports in India. The importer exporter code is nothing but a code given by the Director General of Foreign Trade. Only when you have this code, you are allowed to do export or import. And this can be earlier; it used to be availed by the Central Office in Delhi, but now they have regional licensing authorities in all the 29 states. The next one is. Every export authorized dealer code, every exporter who is involved in a foreign transaction should have a bank account and this account should be informed to Indian Customs and Reserve Bank of India, which is our federal bank, allots a code to each bank and this code is called authorized dealer code. Customs links your IEC number and AD code together and the exporter is also requested, I mean required to register authorized foreign exchange dealer code and open a current account in the designated bank. And all the drawback incentives are credited in these bank accounts. The third one is the business identification number. The exporters have to obtain PAN based on business identification number. 
from the Director General of Foreign Trade without a bill number you cannot file a shipping bill for clearance or export rules. Under the EDA system, PAN-based bills is received online by the custom system from the DGFT. So these three are the mandatory requirements before even you start, you know, doing your imports or exports in India. Next slide, please. There are certain schemes provided by the Indian customs in order to, you know, reduce your duty or, you know, uh, take a, a redemption of duty or, you know, to control your duty payout or whatever. As Mr. Dr. Abdul said, like, the tariffs are very high in India and the duty structure is little complex. And in order to, you know, help the exporters or importers, you know, there are certain schemes which allows them to reduce the duty or even go for a free, you know, duty structure. First one is the advanced license scheme. This allows you to free import of inputs which are physically incorporated in the export product making. And you have a normal allowance for wastage with a specific export obligation in terms of value and quantity. What it means is you can go for an advanced license, but you can... You can go for a duty-free aspect in this, but you need to, you know, you, you have an obligation in terms of exporting an X amount of, uh, you know, value, and by showing that, uh, you know, some get an advanced license. The next one is the export promotion of capital goods. Allows import of capital goods alone for pre-production, production, post-production, post including, you know, CKD and SKD. It allows computer software systems at 3% customs duty, subject to an export obligation equivalent to eight times. Means, if you are asking for a, for example, if you, if your duty is say, $100,000 in a year, you have to fulfill an export obligation of, you know, $800,000 on the export. So, this will be monitored, the record and the register is maintained. And this particular scheme, you know, is very popular in India. A lot of uh, companies bring their capital goods under this scheme. The next one is duty entitlement passport scheme. This is to neutralize the incidence of customs duty on import content of export products and the exporter is entitled for a duty credit as a specified percentage of freight on board. Again, this has to be applied through the, you know, Director General of Foreign Trade. The fourth one is the duty drawback scheme for those transactions in which goods supplied to specific categories of beneficiary do leave the country and the payment for such supplies is received in either Indian rupees or foreign exchange. Fourth one is the deemed export. This refers to the transaction in which goods supply do not leave country. For example, we have a lot of special economic zones in India, and these special economic zones are as good as foreign countries. There is no duty or taxes involved. Now, if you have to supply to these special economic zones inside India, it is considered as deemed exports, and uh, payment of uh, such supplies is received in Indian rupees or foreign exchange. Next slide, please. Just to give an idea about the privilege areas provided by the Indian government, first one is the, the most popular special economic zone in India. This is specifically dealing duty-free enclave. It is as good as a foreign country and for the purpose of trade operation and duties and tariffs. These units can import, procure from domestic tariff area all types of goods and services without payment of duty. That means there is zero duty for this, nothing applies to them. And apart from this, you have uh, export orient unit, electronics hardware technology park scheme, software technology park scheme, or biotechnology park scheme. So these schemes allow operating under duty-free regime for import procurement of all types of goods, including capital goods, without payment of duty for manufacture of goods for export. Now, these schemes are provided only when you have an obligation for export. So this is something which you need to keep in mind. And the next one which is developing is uh, free trade warehousing zone, which is on the Anvil. Indian government is planning to promote a free trade warehousing zone. And uh, this infrastructure will also allow you to, you know, bring in goods from various neighboring countries and do a consolidation in India and then export it out. So this is likely to be starting in the mid of 2010 and most of the customers are, you know, looking eager for this particular scheme. Next one, please. So that's about it. If you have any questions, you can throw it back to us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that very um, substantial uh, presentation, Mr. Anand. Our next speaker will be Mr. Vimal Rat, of uh, who is the manager of planning, engineering, and operations support with Federal Express FedEx in India. Mr. Watt?
Yeah, good morning everyone uh, in US and uh, good evening in for participants from India. Uh, Baba, can I control uh, the movement of the slide? You, uh, you can, just yeah. let me know if you have any problems. Okay. Uh, it's loading. So, okay. Uh, now what I want to cover a lot of things uh, Mr. Anand has uh, covered, so I'll be uh, really quick on those areas. Uh, so what I want to uh, cover here is uh, just the uh, trade regulators and CBEC and key responsibilities of customs, goods classification and uh, understanding the principles of restrictions, import and export governance, mode of uh, export and import clearances. Okay. Uh, now, regulatory structure is uh, normally the trade policies are governed by Ministry of Commerce. They have Department of Commerce and uh, the uh, most important for export import here is Direct Trade General of Foreign Trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they govern the export import policy is governed by Ministry of uh, Commerce. And uh, Department of Commerce is headed by a secretary and they are responsible for countries external trade formulating the trade policy. The DGFT is uh, uh, Directorate General of Foreign Trade is under Department of Commerce and uh, they have active participation in foreign trade policies uh, and the IEC code, uh, the import rate upper code, it's like uh, you have EIN number in the US, it's uh, similar, every company uh, want to import and export, they must have an IEC. And import export licenses and standard input output norms, uh, they are formulated for various drawback schemes. So all these uh, are the key responsibilities of uh, DGFP. Now, uh, the customs department uh, is under Ministry of Finance, Department of Revenue. And then under Department of Revenue, uh, there is Central Board of Excise uh, and Customs who govern uh, the customs department. And customs, uh, the, there is a uh, chairman of CBEC, and uh, under him uh, for customs uh, is member customs. These are the uh, customs uh, policy uh, sitting at a ministry level. They formulate uh, the uh, customs and excise duty, uh, tariffs and rates, protection of domestic industry, prevention of smuggling administrative matters and uh, they are the administrative authority for the subordinate organizations those include the custom houses who are actually uh, people uh, they also call them uh, field formation they are the ones who are at the airports and seaports uh, clearing the shipments the key responsibility of customs is uh, collection of uh, customs duties safeguarding the financial interest and implementing the policies and procedures uh, framed by uh, Ministry of Commerce. So uh, the national economic commercial interests, combating uh, economic uh, and commercial frauds, regulating international trade uh, within foreign trade guidelines, and illicit trafficking, we have to keep a tap on that. The classification of uh, goods whether it's import or export, uh, the classification is the uh, first step that needs to go in there. And India is uh, uh, a participant to WCO, and we adopted the WCO uh, HS uh, classification coding system way back in 1986. And our uh, the customs and excise tariffs are fully aligned with the uh, HS codes. And the uh, nomenclature combined the duty rates is called then uh, we call it tariff. So the only differential between the uh, customs tariff in US and India would be the rate of duty. Otherwise, the classification what you adopt is the same that uh, we adopt in India. And uh, this uh, tariff part is uh, governed by Tariff Act, and that's uh, called tariff schedule. The, there are, uh, for imports into uh, India and even exports more uh, regarding the imports because there are very few restrictions on export. 
So uh, mainly you can uh, classify them uh, all the books in three major categories. One is <coughs> free, doesn't mean free of duty, that means freely importable or they also call it open chain license that you don't need any license to import such commodities. These can be imported and exported uh, freely and it is an on import and export of these commodities. Restricted commodities are uh, where you uh, require a license or a certificate or a permission and then uh, fines and penalties may apply. Prohibited is that you cannot import and export into uh, India. Now the principle of restriction uh, are the uh, protecting the public morals and uh, protecting the human and animal or plant life or health, protection of patents, trademarks, and copyrights, prevention of use of prison labor. So these are the various uh, uh, principles by which the restrictions are uh, governed. Then import and export, uh, as far as the law is concerned, they are governed by uh, Customs Act, which is uh, 1962, Customs Tariff Act, like I mentioned earlier, uh, that's the duty rates and all. Foreign trade policy, uh, the five-year policy uh, that is put down by Ministry of Commerce, it's reviewed every year. Like this, that is like uh, uh, everywhere in the world now uh, for the animal protection and all, arms acts, antiques act, we have drugs and cosmetic acts uh, for cosmetics, uh, uh, and then uh, there are some state government rules and uh, regulations, uh, like uh, Dr. Abdul in his presentation, he was talking about some cross borders, so India has 29 states, so if not 29, so then um, at least you'd have uh, um, 15 states where their local uh, entries are also uh, governed by certain uh, rules, regulations, permissions, and uh, the entry permits. Uh, just to uh, give you a brief uh, on the import and export uh, clearance on uh, the uh, air transportation, uh, the two main uh, categories uh, in air transportation, the express or the courier mode they call, and uh, then we have the uh, formal entry or the entries those are fired in the cargo mode. So there are three main governing uh, areas or filters, as you can say, that it's the contents, uh, gems and jewelry, and anything related to the export promotion schemes like Mr. Anand uh, mentioned in detail and uh, repair and return. So uh, these categories we can clear in express mode uh, that, that it requires a formal entry. And uh, if uh, the uh, on the export side, uh, the samples valuing more than 50,000, gifts valuing more than 25,000, or anything with commercial transaction, again, a formal uh, exit uh, from the country. And uh, with single piece shipment weighing more than 32 kgs or dimensions, uh, these are basically the weight and size uh, are by the airline security they put. So these are uh, these three categories. Uh, you need a formal exit from the country. I'm sorry, it should be formal exit, not entry. And uh, similarly on the import side. If uh, the low value documents, low value and medium value, these three categories those are shown in this presentation, they uh, they don't require a formal entry, can be cleared on a express or courier bill of entry. However, the high value requires a formal entry. So the documents, they just x-ray, you just make one simple declaration for documents. And low value is uh, gifts and samples up to 10,000 rupees or $200. India doesn't uh, follow the uh, de minimis uh, entirely. We have a selective de minimis. I would say for uh, it's for samples and gifts up to $200. If it is not a sample, not a gift, and the value is still within uh, $200, it doesn't fall under de minimis. There is a duty on it. So that selective de minimis on uh, low value uh, that uh, uh, can be in express mode. 
the medium value that is more than 10,000 rupees or 200, between 200 to 2,000 dollars. Uh, they are cleared on again uh, express entry uh, with uh, examination and duty uh, rate as applicable. The higher value require a formal entry. So the value uh, that I've mentioned about here, $200, $2,000, this is uh, the landed value of the goods. So uh, it's not the declared value, it's declared value plus insurance plus freight plus 1% uh, port charges. Now uh, here I've uh, given a, uh, a little bit of comparison on express and formal uh, entry, the paperwork and uh, the procedure wise. On express clearance uh, we have uh, the provision of uh, pre-clearance. So before arrival of the flight, the assessment and uh, release can be uh, procured from customs. So on arrival, they do examination and final release. However, in uh, formal entry, uh, the process is uh, tedious. It's uh, not as simple as in the express entry. And 90% uh, of the shipments arriving in express mode are cleared uh, within four to six hours of arrival. However, uh, on formal entry, it may take uh, uh, one day at least. Clearance uh, up to 100,000, uh, that is the restriction on uh, excess uh, mode of clearance. However, on uh, the formal side, there is no value limit. Consignee participation is uh, required on clearance only more than $2,000. However, uh, every entry on uh, formal entry, you need consignee to participate. You need such uh, documents from consignee, uh, the authorization letters, uh, and the valuation declarations. The express clearance uh, in Delhi and Bombay are 24 by 7. And uh, the clearance is under uh, license if the uh, consignee's importer is uh, uh, availing any uh, benefit then uh, that is not permissible on its SI, it has to be on a formal entry. And uh, duty, normally the express companies, they advance the duty on behalf of uh, the customer and uh, uh, take the reimbursement on delivery. And best practice, normally uh, the on the formal side, uh, it's the consignee who advances the duty. So uh, the main import clearance uh, paperwork Although there are, there are more, but those, those are more specific to the different commodities. This is the general paperwork that you will uh, need for all kind of shipments, uh, airbill, commercial invoice, packing list, IEC, and the authority letter from uh, consignee that is required on express side only more than $2,000. However, on uh, the formal clearance side, you need it uh, for each and every shipment. And the uh, same goes with the valuation declaration. The main uh, pain points uh, that uh, we have on import clearances, not everything is attributed to customs. There are other uh, regulators like airport regulators and all. Uh, they also, their procedures and uh, uh, also cause uh, some delays. The IGM filing delays, the IGM or the import manifest uh, needs to be filed by the carrier at least uh, four hours before arrival of the flight. So if that is delayed, that is the starting point for the import uh, clearance that needs to be filed first. And then uh, if, uh, if it's on the cargo side, the cargo arrival notice or the delivery order, in case consignee is opting for his own broker to clear, if that is delayed, the entire process gets delayed. On the airport side, the uh, segregation and location allocation, like uh, Mr. Anand said, most of the flights arrive uh, during the night, so that uh, uh, that delays the uh, process. And uh, shipment getting into the warehouse and getting a location, and uh, without that, your examination cannot uh, start. On the clearance delay, the disputes are normally on graduation and classification. Plus uh, the other regulatory bodies like uh, ADCs, uh, truck controller, wildlife, or any licenses, those are the main uh, areas where uh, it is on import uh, 
happen. Exactly. On export, I've not touched too much because export is uh, the uh, we can uh, in express side it's uh, just about a three hour activity, and uh, on the reporting <coughs> side, uh, four to five hours. Yeah. Uh, that's all I have, and uh, my contact details. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, can please contact me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ross, for that very interesting uh, presentation with lots of good information, I think, from all of our speakers. Um, at this point, um, uh, we will have a question and answer time. Operator, Christine, are you there? Can you open the lines for questions for us? Yes, thank you. At this time, we'd like to begin the question and answer session of conference. If you would like to ask a question, please press star, then 1. You must record your first and last name clearly. To withdraw your question, you may press star, then 2. Once again, if you would like to ask a question at this time, please press star, then 1, and record your first and last name clearly. One moment for the first question, please. The first question comes from Patty Ellison. You may ask your question. Um, are express bill ladings allowed to clear shipments in India on ocean? Can I ask one of our customs um, um, experts to answer that? Yes, it is allowed. OK, thank you. The next question comes from John Balsam. You may ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, specific question dealing with getting a RMA unit back out of India to uh, our office. We we basically ship a network appliance that has a standard uh, computer server with proprietary software on it. So we originally sold and imported uh, into India a number of the units uh, at full value, uh, and uh, although they but they asked us to break out the hardware portion with the software portion. We normally don't do that, but we, but we did in this case. Um, one of those units failed uh, just recently. We shipped a replacement unit to them. And in, in our cases, we ship uh, at whatever the insured value is, which is really just the cost of the uh, excuse me, the hardware in that case. Got the unit in successfully, uh, and the value was, for example, three thousand uh, dollars, where the original cost is twenty thousand. That was on the original commercial invoice. But now we can't get the unit back out because the, our customers are saying that they need to value that unit at like twenty thousand dollars, and we're concerned that we'll end up paying some type of a, of a tax or duty on that value versus the value that of the unit that we actually replaced with it. Um, so my question is, what do we, uh, what should we value that uh, unit that we need to get returned back from India? Uh, how long back uh, this original unit was brought into India? Well, it was imported last year. And uh, we've imported probably 15 of those units, and this is just one unit that's failed. And we were, we already replaced it. We already sent them a new unit. We're just trying to get the old unit back out. And there's a different that we have a conflict, I guess, in how much we should value that unit for. And, and we don't really care what they what they value it as long as we're not responsible for any type of uh, of duty or tariff on the way back out. There are no export duties out of India. Okay. Uh, the valuation they need uh, for the export documentation, and uh, if it was, uh, uh, it's an uh, old unit, they can always use a depreciated value, uh -huh. uh, and uh, accordingly they can uh, export it out. Uh, Advisable is that uh, there is a repair and return thing that they should have uh, availed uh, and could have sent the unit uh, back earlier, but they can. Exported, but uh, there is no export duty. Now. Okay, so I mean, just just to clarify, we we value the replacement unit at three thousand um, dollars. We thought that that's what they should value it when when they when they're asking for a value that they should value it at three thousand dollars to get it back out of the country. But they seem to think that they need to value it at whatever the original cost was. The three thousand dollars is the original cost. 
No, twenty thousand dollars was the original cost, and that was on the original commercial invoice when they first imported it last year. We got a replacement unit into them at, with a three thousand dollar value because that's just the cost of the hardware, and that's what we said that should be the value that they place on the the, the faulty unit to, to ship it back out. And they seem to, they seem to think that they need to put the original value of twenty thousand dollars on that unit. That's what we can't understand. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's right, and uh, they they have to all they can do is uh, depreciate uh, put a one year depreciation on it and uh, okay. uh, put the value around the, whatever the depreciation year they must be taking. Uh, if it is five years, then uh, four thousand less. That is fifteen thousand uh, can be the depreciated value. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. The next question comes from Steve Shaw. Do you may ask your question. Uh, yes, I was just wondering uh, uh, the what's the price uh, differential between express clearance and uh, your normal clearance, that last item that they covered. How much more does it cost you to do it, express clearance? The clearance uh, cost, I would say in the express side, normally the clearance cost is uh, included in your transportation. Okay. Uh, and the duties and uh, tax are same on both the sides. The same tariff that uh, is followed on express as of the clearance. Uh, for express clearance, if it is within $2,000, uh, there is uh, no ex no clearance uh, cost uh, built separately. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good. The next question comes from Ken Anselm. You may ask your question. Uh, on the documentation required uh, to enter the country, uh, I noticed value declaration. Can you explain what uh, constitutes value declaration, and in particular, uh, uh, when uh, shipping used equipment into the country as well as new? And then a secondary question is, uh, does customs buy interest on the duties when the uh, equipment is in uh, bonded warehouses? Yeah. See, okay. when the cargo is imported into India and it is getting bonded in a warehouse, the customs give 90 days interest free. Yes. And after 90 days, it is 15% per annum on the duty amount, which is being levied by the customs as interest. And what about the value declaration? What constitutes value dec declarations? What, what are, you is, uh, talking about, are you talking about the second-hand missionary or the new missionaries? Both. See, the... I mean, uh, the value declaration for a new one is your actual value which you declare in the commercial invoice. But customs also has, you know, the, the, the identical rates of those equipments in India. So if it matches with that, then it works fine. But when it comes to a second-hand missionary, I mean, it depends on, you know, how you depreciate the value of used missionaries. Normally, customs allows you to depreciate up to 70% of the you know, the original value of the used machinery, not beyond that. But even then, whenever a second-hand machinery comes inside India, customs has authorized certified chartered engineers. So these chartered engineers will assess the used machinery, and they give the value of the, I mean, they make an assessment and, you know, come at a, arrive at a value, and this value will be announced to customs and the importer. So irrespective of whether you depreciate 50% or 70%, the chartered engineer's certification or the assessment of the value is final. On new equipment, uh, what what is acceptable for a declaration? The commercial invoice has not been acceptable in the past. We've had to for, to uh, provide additional value declarations, and and that's been a bit confusing. Uh, see, um, for a used missionary importation into India. Um, the chartered engineers which have been listed in, by the customs, they will give the value, they will assess the I mean, equipment and they will recommend the value to the customs. 
So we invoice value, the uh, charter engineer given value, and the customs transaction value, whichever is the higher, the customs will levy duty on the higher yes. value. This is one area. And the other area is the customs always go by a transaction value rules for all the new products. Okay, if it is your, uh, your uh, goods is a new machine or new equipment which is coming into India and that uh, the value declared in your invoice should match with the uh, value, the record price of the customs. If that is the case, the customs will very well accept your invoice value and levy duty on that. Well, we've been asked for uh, uh, product catalogs and uh, uh, documentation to publish uh, pricing lists and that type of thing. Uh, and not all of our manufacturers uh, have uh, published price lists. So it's it's been a matter of uh, how do we generate a price list when we don't uh, don't have a publicly uh, published price list. Okay, this would be a case where you bring in a missionary. And is it a, a new kind of sophisticated machinery? Uh, it's new equipment, sophisticated. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. No, because, uh, I mean, uh, if there is no transaction price available for a particular equipment when it arrives, and in that case, customs may require to provide the product catalog and then you know the price. the price list. But otherwise, predominantly, most of the assessment happens with the commercial invoice of the customer. Unless if the equipment is new into India and there is no transaction value for it in the customer. Okay. Thank you. The next question comes from Jose Whitman. You may ask your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions, actually. Uh, number one, I have a similar situation uh, like the one just expressed. Um, we just sent a couple samples to India from one of our customers. Uh, the value of the product, real value, is $85, and customs had uh, assessed the value of the product for $715. Seems to me like uh, customs doesn't have any kind of any kind of tariff in there, and they just check in Google. So I have no idea how they get into this. However, my customer is refusing to pay the duties for $750 because that will set a precedent for the next importation. Is there anything that can be done about that? Uh, we have public price list. We can certify any price list with the chambers, and co uh, chambers of commerce and so on. Is there anything that we can do about that? Uh, has the duty been paid and shipment released? No, no. The customer actually, we send this by FedEx, and uh, the customer actually uh, refuses shipment because uh, the custom duty was more than $250. And he was afraid of taking this and then setting the present custom that the real value is $715, which is not the case on this product. This is not the first time that we have. Can we challenge time on uh, value on that, like you said, you have some uh, list and some uh, value evidence available. Okay. Uh, you can uh, definitely challenge customs uh, on the value if it's a uh, documentary document to uh, provide uh, to prove the value is 85 plus. You can definitely do that. Uh, it's uh, It was sent through FedEx, you said? Yes. Yep. Okay, uh, you have my email ID, and uh, if you can send me the details, I'll personally look into I think we can challenge it, yes. Okay, wonderful. And the, the last two questions is, first, um, about the free zone um, in India, it works like any other free zone uh, all over the world, so the product basically is stationary in there, and the pay duties only when it's released into the country? Yeah. The, the free trade zone, as you said, it's like any other free trade zone in the world. But uh, if you want to sell it for the domestic market or for the Indian consumption, then you have to pay the local duties. Okay. And on the event that there is no sell in, in internally, could be re-exported? Thank you, pardon. Can you please come again? That in the event that the product is not consumed or sold into the domestic market in India, 
Can I re-export that product to the region, to other countries? You can. You can. Okay. The, free, the, the special economic zones or the free trade zones are basically foreign countries inside India. Okay. So you can bring in, take it out. As long as you don't sell it for domestic consumption, you don't have to pay any duties or taxes. Okay. Thank you. The next question comes from Lewis Rothberg. You may ask your question. Oh, yes. My question is just simple. I was not able to write fast enough to get some of the excellent information. Will we be given a set of these charts? Yes, I can answer that for you. Yes, we, I will be sending out the slides, um, and there will be a recorded version also of the webinar available afterwards. All right. When can we anticipate receiving the slides? That's it. Um, uh, within the next day. All right. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. The next question comes from Abe Thomas. You may ask your question. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much. Um, we are uh, exporters of musical instruments for education to India. Um, in our case, we had shipped some harmonicas into India, and that was being used by a customer, and one of the customers needed uh, one of the harmonicas repaired. Uh, so we sent it out from India via EMS post, um, and have an outbound EMS number for it. It went to Japan, Suzuki Japan, who uh, repaired the harmonica and then sent it back via EMS post. And on the export declaration, they have marked clearly that this is a repaired harmonica, no commercial value, and with the, with the marking of $5 uh, for customs purposes. However, when it arrived in India, um, the customs officer assessed or asked our employee in, in Bangalore um, what the value of the product is, and he gave a, a rupee value, 6,000 rupees. And uh, uh, even though it was marked on there that it was, for re it was a repaired harmonica uh, brought back with no commercial value, they assessed a duty on it of approximately 1,900 rupees. Um, and of course, after having visited these folks three or four times and spending three or four days there, uh, I just told them, look, just pay the clearance fee because it works out to about 40 US dollars. Time is worth more money than this. So, you know, how do we avoid this for any type of future imports where a product needs to be sent out for repair and needs to come back in where we are not assessed duty twice on the same product? Okay, uh, at the, uh, on the express of uh, the cargo side, uh, on EMS, I'm not very really aware, uh, but on the express and cargo side, when we export anything for uh, repair and it comes back, uh, we declare at the time of export that uh, this is going for a repair and return. And uh, the first import uh, documentation is so true <laughs> that's the center. Uh, it, the other thing which is very important is uh, in such cases is uh, having a very visible and clear marks and number uh, endorsed by customs, uh, the serial numbers and all. At the time of import, the invoice uh, that's coming in should uh, give the value of uh, repair cost mm -hmm. and transportation. So that's only proportion which is dutiable when it comes back here. Yeah. I see. Well, the... You know, this is a, uh, in India they call these mouth organs, um, harmonicas. There, there is no serial number yeah. on it. In fact, that is one of the questions that the customs officer asks. How do we know that this is not a new product and it's, it is a repaired product? Well, there was one month worth of email communications that took place on this thing from the customer to the factory, the factory uh, requesting us to please send it back for repair. We, we, we presented all of that documents. And we told them there is no such thing as a serial number on this. However, here is the outbound EMS numbers. But, you know, this is interesting. You say that. You are with FedEx, sir? Are you with FedEx? Pardon me? Are you with FedEx? Yes, I am, sir. Okay, so that's great. Yes, because in the future, this is something that we, we, we can use. Because this way there is, you know, you just mentioned that for an export of this, you have to have a declaration. Well, at the postal service or at the EMS, we did not have any way to document that this was 
going out. However, we presented them. Yeah, the that's a uh, problem because uh, that that's very important uh, to match. And uh, we recently, uh, our own equipment we sent out, and uh, we paid the duty only on the repair cost. Uh, it was uh, worth uh, one thousand eight hundred dollars that we imported from US and for repairs, and the repair cost was just twenty five dollars. And uh, the transportation another ten dollars. So on return we duty only on thirty five dollars, not one thousand eight hundred dollars second. Is there any way to now go back to the customs and you know the customer was quite upset to know about this um aspect, but we took care of you know customer care as such. We 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 paid for it ourselves. We by the way have an office in India. We had Thomas Music Corporation has opened an office in India and we have a presence there. Um and we wanted to give the same level of service that we give to customers here in the U.S. Uh, therefore, we handled it ourselves. Um, now, if, they, if it was being sent to a customer directly, they do not have an import-export code number, do they? You know, a consumer... Uh, uh, if it is a uh, personal shipment, then uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the customs officer on the ship, the assistant uh, commissioner, we just have to make a request to him. He allows on a, a customs uh, IC code number. They have one reserved for such uh, shipments. I see. For, 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 for direct to customers. Yeah, for direct one-time importer who is not a regular importer and exporter, he won't have an IC code. So uh, then uh, we make a form a request uh, a request to the assistant commissioner of customs, and he allows them uh, to file that entry uh, on that uh, particular course. I see. Thank you very much for your and as far as uh, yeah, go ahead. You're welcome. As far as uh, your question about if we go to customs back on your harmonica case. We can always challenge, but I don't uh, see too much for uh, success coming on this because there is no proof of export plus uh, the uh, marks and numbers and uh, it's, uh, there's no identification uh, for that. So uh, it can always be challenged, but uh, we can't consider of getting any reimbursement from systems. In this particular case, I, I see it uh, be a challenge. Well, you know, most of the mouth organs or the harmonicas do not have a marking on them uh, as far as a serial number is concerned. Uh, you know, how do we address that? How do you address it if, if, if one was to be sent out that way? We have, we do have one harmonica, one mouth organ that costs $3,000. That, that has uh, a serial number on it. But um, there are other items such as this where, that, you know, most musical instruments, uh, don't have, uh, uh, well, electronic instruments do, but I'm talking about, you know, um, mouth organs do not have serial numbers put on them. Um, so, uh, how. You, you know what? Maybe, maybe should we, uh, I, I think there are maybe other questions in, in queue. Yes. Can, yes. can we uh, can we talk about that specific case offline? Uh, yes, you, surely you, can. Is, that, is that okay, uh, Mr. Yes. Thomas? Yes, and I appreciate your, your, your answers. You've given me some good tips on future shipments. We will contact you for next. Thank you. Yeah, and then you have the contact information and the direct email, so you can follow up on that, and that certainly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Barbara, and thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Operator, are there other questions? Yes, ma'am. The next question comes from Amy Jacker. You may ask your question. Hi, my question is pretty simple. I just uh, want to find out if original commercial invoices, original signed commercial invoices, are always requ required in India. Yes, it is always required for the sea shipments, but for air shipments, copies are fine. Of the commercial invoice, not of the uh, airway bill? Commercial invoice. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Deloria Williams. You may ask your question. Um, yes, um, we are actually uh, re-exporters of um, mosquito control products, and um, we're buying goods um, exports from a factory in Karur, and um, in full container quantities. And what's happening is our freight forwarder is shipping it from Karur to Chennai in um, trucks. And um, they said that they're doing that because of the inspection that has to take place in Chennai. 
And uh, what I suggested to them is to do it in um, containers, and they said that they could not do it. So um, I guess my question is, you know, what's the reason behind this, and um, is there any other way that we could um, have them to ship uh, containers and stuff them at the factory? Uh, what is the product, uh, madam? They're um, mosquito nets. Mosquito nets. Yes. yes. There are two types of uh, explanation which can be affected. One type is the, uh, the manufacturer in India can stuff the cargo in their warehouse in a container with a central excise or custom supervision and that can be taken to Chennai port and can be exported. This is one way. The other way is they can move the cargo to Chennai container freight stations, keep the cargo there, do the customs examination, stuff the cargo in a container and they can move it to the Chennai port. These are the two, two ways that, can, uh, that the manufacturer can export it. Okay, so the second one is that that's basically what they're doing now. They're shipping trucks and then um, and then uh, examining it, then stuffing it at the at the port. You can prefer the first one also, uh, but the exporter in uh, India has to be registered with the uh, in, in the jurisdictional central excise authority or the customs authority to carry out the customs examination in their own warehouse. Okay, what what um, would be involved in doing that? What would be the uh, cost? to have that done, if any? Yeah, it is just a registration. It is just a registration of the manufacturer with the concerned jurisdictional authorities of customs and central excise, and they have to make a special application after the registration to carry out a customs examination or a central excise examination inside their warehouse. And they, they have been given a special authority also by the customs and the central excise to do a self-sealing themselves in their own warehouse. Okay, so then that official would just come out and then do the inspection. Section there. Okay. Okay. And actually, I had another question. Uh, this is just a, a short one. Um, where can we obtain a uh, national an Indian national holiday schedule? Indian national? Uh, it's a national holiday schedule, so they will know what the uh, holiday is, because we always um, um, are finding out kind of after the fact that there's a holiday there. Holiday list. Holiday list, right? There is yeah. not... Uh, the listed holidays, as per the Indian government, is only 12. But uh, for customs, it varies. I mean, it varies from zone to zone. There is no uniform holiday for the whole of Indian customs. It is oh. different in Bombay. It is different in Chennai. So we can send it across to you. Not a problem. You can send that? Okay. Tell me which, are, which is the location you are looking for so that uh, that particular customs jurisdiction holiday list I can send it across. Okay. That will be for Chennai and for uh, Haldia Port. Okay. Okay. Again, so, the so go ahead and, and maybe follow up by email with one of our customs experts uh, and, and ask them for that. That's probably the okay. best way. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Lynn Brannigan. You may ask your question. Hi. Good morning. We are a manufacturer and exporter of automotive lubricants, chemicals, and um, we have not attempted to export to the Indian market yet, but it's on my radar for this year. So my question um, goes back to the BIN number. We use a freight forwarder for all of our shipments, and then we don't get into any of the import on the other side. So is this BIN number essential for us before we start exporting? No. If you are exporting it, it is not applicable to you. All those uh, BIN number or IEC is applicable only to the importer in India. Excellent. Thank you. The next question comes from Margaret Bunnell. You may ask your question. Yes, thank you. I have two questions. We are a manufacturer of telecommunications equipment. We would like to do a demonstration for a potential client in India. This would result in very, very substantial duties and taxes. We anticipate, based on the numbers that we've seen, it could be as much as a half a million dollars in duties and taxes. Since India does not accept the ATA Carnet, what are the opportunities for a duty-free temporary import into India? Yeah. Uh, as you referred uh, rightly, the ATA Carnet is the best way to import into India, and you will face no hassle 
with the Indian government to import it as a ATA carnet, provided your consignee in India should have the supporting documents uh, uh, required by the notification, customs notification. If those documents are in hand, it can be imported as a ATA carnet without payment of any duties. This is one way. If the other way around is without payment of duties, you can import it as a temporary import, pay the duty during clearance of customs during importation in India. Then after completing all the uh, exhibitions and displays, it can be re-exported. After re-exportation, whatever the duties paid can be taken as a drawback from the customs by the consignee in India. But it, it cannot be a 100% refund. It may be on a slab rate based on the period of usage. Understood. A second question we have is we've recently run into several requests for chartered engineering certificates for used equipment coming into the country. We have some uh, development happening in country. And is, we haven't had this come up before. Is this something that's always been a requirement but not often requested, or has there been a regulatory change? Uh, it, is, it is a mandatory requirement for the, all the used equipment imported into India. There are two, there are two ways. One is the customs has listed the chartered engineers which have been nominated by the customs. These chartered engineers have branches all over the world. So during your exportation to India, you can use the, one of the uh, chartered engineers who have been in the list so that to avoid one more examination in India. But this chartered engineer certification for a used equipment is a mandatory for Indian input. And if I send you an email under separate cover, could you direct me to the list of pre-approved chartered engineers for the U.S.? Definitely. Definitely I can do it. Okay. And this is Mr. Anand? Yes. Thank you. Did you want to follow up? Okay. Thank you. The next question comes from Paul Lynch. You may ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is this. Um, first of all, we are a manufacturer of what are medium value capital goods on the order, typical order value $300,000 plus. Um, is there a way, on occasion, we would be asked to handle a, an order all the way through FOB delivered to the job site? Is there a way to quickly and conveniently get a, a, a decent estimate of what our total um, uh, duty, taxes, fees, et cetera, would be for purposes of estimating what the cost would be to deliver to a job site in India? You can uh, do an approximate estimation of your uh, duties uh, into India. Just send me across your uh, email ID and the contact details. We can give you the link. And in fact, uh, Indian Customs is coming up with their user-friendly website where you just have to go there and put the HTS classification and it will list out all the possible duties into India. Okay, and who's speaking, please? Um, Vijay Anand from Expeditors. No, I'm sorry, your name, sir? Expeditors. Oh, okay, very good. I'll send you an email. One more quick question, if I may. Um, in the event that uh, uh, there's a problem with a product, uh, once it's installed and we have to dispatch an engineer and or replacement parts, what is the impact of that type of thing on uh, uh, duties and customs on parts that are replacing something that has uh, failed on a, on a job site? So you're talking about replacement parts or? Uh... Yes, sir, under warranty service, a part that's, that was, pre, uh, was originally shipped in has failed and a replacement part must be sent or uh, installed. Do we have to pay duty and, and everything else on that replacement part? Right. It, is, it, uh, it depends actually, uh, but as of now, whatever the replacement parts, warranty parts which is coming into India is being, being levied for customs duty. Uh, so in other words, the answer is basically yes, the duty must be paid on any replacement parts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. The next question comes from Tina Sabrinsky. You may ask your question. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, we're a manufacturer of vibration data collectors, um, hardware and software, and we are doing business with a partner in India. They're basically a distributor for us, and we are exporting our data collectors to them to utilize in service work. They collect the data, and then they send that to us for analysis. So the data collectors are not for sale. They're for their use only to collect the data um, and then get it back to us via email or over the Internet. What kind of value should we assess on the data collectors? These are used pieces of equipment, and they're not reselling them. We've been using our COGS. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I don't follow you. Can you please repeat it? Sure. <laughs> we basically have a, a distributor in India, a partner we're working with, and what they are going to do is we send them our data collector to go out and collect data on machinery with various customers, and then they will, um, via the Internet, send that data to us for analysis. The problem we are having is what value to put on the data collectors when we export them. They're used pieces of equipment, and they are not selling them. They're just utilizing them. We own them. Yeah. yeah, now I understand. See, the valuation should always be your actual pricing. Actual pricing of the product has to be mentioned in your in invoices. For the, for the export into India, because the customs have something called the transaction value rules, uh, which is be, being coined by the uh, Customs Act Section 14, transaction values. So customs always go by the actual price of the product. Even if you don't put a price for these particular uh, data collectors, the customs will have a value for these data collectors and they will calculate the duty accordingly. Well, we're putting a price, but we were putting our cost of goods sold, our COGS, because they're not selling them and they're used pieces of equipment. So after the usage, is this data collectors are sent back? The, we retain ownership, so they might have them for a year or even two years. They would only send them back to us for repair or if we terminated our relationship with them. But we retain ownership. No, you retain ownership, but uh, do you get it back out of India or uh, it remains here? It would be remaining in India as long as we had a relationship with this part, with this company. Yeah, so it's simple. I mean, you have to declare a value for these data collectors, and whatever is the price of this data collector has to be, you know, displayed in the invoice. Okay, and do we put anything in there? Um, does it help the end user because the company we're working with is getting assessed high high duties, evidently? And does it help to put that it's not for resale? Oh, it, it, uh, it is immaterial that it is for a resale or for your own consumption or for uh, the trading activity in India. It is immaterial for customs. The valuation is, uh, uh, the, the customs will go for valuation based on the actual price of the product. For example, whatever the, the same product, if you are selling it to a third party, the same price has to be mentioned for your internal transactions and even for your uh, own use in India. Okay. Thank you. I think that that's actually all the time we have. Um, we've gone just two minutes over. Uh, and. Uh, if so, if, if uh, there are additional questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, um, please feel free to contact any of the speakers that are listed on the screen. I'd like to thank all of our participants for being with us today. And if our, for further information on exporting, I hope you, can, you will consult www.export.gov or call 1-800-USA-TRADE. And I'd also like to thank our, our speakers uh, for being a resource to our U.S. exporters. I think we got a lot of good information uh, out there today, and so we're very appreciative. Uh, thanks again to everyone for joining us. This, this is the end of the call. Yeah, Baba, just a second. Oh, sure. Okay, one more thing. Yeah, this is Mara Prakshan. I, I think Mr. Vijay, I'm